Getting to Know the Bible. Welcome, everybody. Opening a Bible for the first time may be disconcerting for people. So many pages, so many words, no pictures, just black ink or maybe some red where Jesus was speaking. Starting to read from the beginning can after a while be discouraging. I once knew a person who read about the first 500 pages before they thought, I don't get this. That was a valiant effort. Randomly turning the pages and dipping in anywhere possibly doesn't help much either though you can get a thought for the day. However, that doesn't give you an overall picture of the Bible. It can just feel like there's so much to take in. Where do you start? So today, we're going to start with a reading of Joshua chapter two. Joshua is the sixth book in the Bible in the Old Testament. You will find it about 200 pages in from page one of the Bible. And we'll give you some time to find it. And then we're going to read it. Are you waiting for me, Jackie, to read? Yes. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 2, and I'm reading from the um, revised standard version. Can you hear me all right? Yes, thank you. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, Behold, certain men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, men came to me, but I did not know where they came from. And when the gate was to be closed at dark, the men went out. Where the men went to, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fjord, fords. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no courage left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God is he who is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now then, swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign and save alive my father and mother 
my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, then we will deal kindly and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she dwelt in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless, guiltless with respect to this oath of yours, which you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall bind this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. If anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid upon anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath, which you have made us swear. And she said, <clears throat> according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. For the pursuers had made search all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men came down again from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. And they told him all that they had befallen them. And they said to Joshua, truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands. And moreover, all the inhabitants of the land are faint hearted because of us. Thank you. So just hold those thoughts, everybody. We'll go back to that later in the seminar. <clears throat> God wants his words to be accessible and has matched his message to the needs of people. God, the God of love, wants people to be, to be reassured by his message. And he has ensured that help is available. First, it's helpful to read the Bible with friends or family. And it's helpful to talk about it with other Bible believers. And it's helpful to download and follow a Bible reading plan. And always pray to God for insight and direction. Perhaps you're already a Bible reader and you know loads about the Bible already and you're thinking, I don't need this. Well, an amazing thing about God's word is that it grows with people as they grow spiritually and in their understanding and knowledge. As a person develops in their appreciation of God and his ways, there is always more waiting to be learned. It's just amazing. There are new things to discover and new things to understand. And words that have just never been there before suddenly appear, even if you are a person who has read the Bible for many, many years something about it. So let's start. 
The Bible is a collection of books inspired by God, written over a period of 1,600 years by many different authors. So you would expect there to be a whole lot of differences in that. So if you put the books of the Bible, of the Bible on a bookshelf like this picture, this is how they would be arranged. So in the Old Testament, which is the first 60% of the Bible, you have five books of law, you have a number of books of history, some poetry, some large books of prophecy, and some shorter books of prophecy. When you go to the New Testament, you first have four books called Gospels, which are the life stories of Jesus Christ. Then you have one history book, which is the first 30 or 20 or 30 years of teaching the message across, across the Roman Empire. Then you have two shelves here, no, three shelves of letters to collections of believers or to individuals. And right at the end, you have one book of prophecy. So that's a quick guide to the 66 books that are bound together in what we know as the Holy Bible. As may be expected of a book inspired by God, the creator of everything except evil, there is a consistent message throughout the Bible. Logic, coherence and consistency are at big picture level and at quite trivial detail level as well. And we will look at some of those, some examples of those later on in this seminar. So a good starting point, if you're new to the Bible, is look for that consistency. The books were written by many people over a long time, but the same ideas are everywhere. And here's a very brief summary of the ideas that the Bible is full of. God's love for people he created. His desire to save people from death and his grant of life slash death, freedom of choice. And his plan to save the world. Those are the big ideas that you can search for all the way through the Bible as a good starting point for grasping what it's about. The Bible also provides an insight into the creator's mind, his values and his character. So what God thinks is important, how God thinks, what God treasures and what his character is. You will find all of those in the Bible. The Bible contains law, promises, history, poetry, letters and predictions and wonderful records of people and their relationship with God or not. Potential difficulties for someone new to the Bible. This book written two millennia plus ago comes with a range of challenges. Language, culture and customs, unknown people, 
unknown places. Spiritual concepts that may be new to a reader, different ideas. However, none of these are insurmountable because there are many helpful resources available. So if a person is new to the Bible, do not give up. Tell yourself, well, there's lots of help out there. So where do I start? For more on these subjects that are listed on this slide, there's more in-depth information on those in seminars one, two, and three in this series. And there's a web reference at the end that will show you where to find those. So first of all, the language challenge. The Bible was not written in English. The language of most of the Old Testament was Hebrew, the language of Israel. The language of later books in the Old Testament was Aramaic, which is a Middle Eastern language. And the language of the New Testament was Greek, because that was the spoken and written language still in first century Middle Eastern countries. The Greek Empire had gone and the Roman Empire was prevailing, but the Greek language still was the written language that they used for first century writing. Therefore, any Bible that most people will encounter is a translation from those languages. If your first language is Old Greek, you will be very comfortable with the New Testament. If your first language is Hebrew, you may be very comfortable with the Old Testament. But for most people, the vast majority of people do not speak those languages. So it's a translation. It was not originally written in English. According to the Encyclopedia Online Wikipedia, at October 2019, the Bible had been translated into 698 languages, the entire Bible. The New Testament alone had been translated into 1,548 languages and parts of the Bible into another 1,138 languages. That's a pretty good record. Many of these translations are freely available online. Translation into English began in the 7th century and has continued since then. There's plenty of English Bibles to choose from. Each give a, a different level of English depending on ability from much simpler translations for second language people or the quite complex 16th century language of the King James Version. There were not many English Bibles until late in the 20th century. And here is a table of most of the modern versions that are out there. This does not include one that's come along called the Net Bible. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, no, no, there's another one. This one, New English Translation, net, maybe that's it. Yes, 2005. Sorry, it is in there. So you can see there's been quite a proliferation recently. So you can have the message is very much a one person's view of the Bible, quite 
challenging, quite amusing, very easy to read, but it's not a study Bible. If you want study Bibles, you go to more scholarly Bibles, because most of them are translated by a committee who compare notes. And for most people, that makes it much more credible than one person's view. Other challenges than language. Bible readers will encounter other fascinating challenges, culture, customs, values, unknown people, unrecognizable country names. One of the customs that's come to my head is they, in the, the Bible talks about sprinkling ashes on their head as a sign of mourning, a sign of sadness. Tearing their clothes is another one that is a cultural custom. So there are those things that you have to put your head around if you're going, as you're reading the Bible. Help is available for these challenges too. So obviously talking to friends who know bits that I don't know or you don't know is always helpful. It's a bit like computer software. This person over there knows that particular thing and that person knows something else. Nobody knows everything. Well, it's a bit like that with the Bible too. Any Bible topic can easily be researched either online particularly or on paper. So many people love the Bible that it has created a huge demand for knowledge about it. So this is why there's so many rich explanations available about Bible history, Bible geography, Bible ideas, characters, teaching, words, cultures and customs. It's all available. Do not give up. There are online Bibles. There are concordances. What's a concordance? Next slide. There are Bible dictionaries. There are Bible encyclopedias. There's search engines, apps, Wikipedia, websites by the hundred. However, always remember that God's word is the authority, not any person's thinking or ideas. Concordance. This strange word means simply an alphabetic list of all the different words that occur in a book and where they are to be found. Exhaustive concordances contain every word in the Bible, would you believe? Here is possibly the most well-known of all, Strong's Bible Concordance, dating from the second half of the 19th century. Many people used to have this great big fat book called the Concordance. Now, of course, it's online and takes up no storage at all, just a bit on your hard drive. A concordance is useful when you're trying to locate a verse and can only remember a word or phrase of that verse. So for example, if you know God loved the world, where's that you think? And you've got 1500 pages or something to look through you would go to a concordance and search. You wouldn't look for search for so, God so loved the world, because that's used too many times. God, well, that's used a lot. 
loved, maybe, world is probably a good place to start. And you look for all, all the occurrences in the list of world and eventually you'll find the verse you're looking for. They're useful for doing word studies by looking at other passages where the same word is used. So you might go, okay, well, where else does it talk about world? What ideas are there around this word of world? And they give links to the original language so that the meanings of the foreign word can be researched. So in world, you might find there's more than one Greek word that has been translated world into English. So there's another little line of inquiry. So here's off the internet a picture of part of a page in a concordance. So look at the first under spring sang this song and then it says capital S. That means that's the word spring, spring up. And it says Numbers 21 verse 17 and the foreign word is number 5927. And in the back of the concordance, there's a list of all the foreign words and their meaning and how they're translated. So that's how a concordance works. If you want to do an investigation into the English word that's been used, or what other ideas are there to learn about a particular idea in the whole Bible. So that's concordances. Since the internet was invented, Many Bibles have been published online. Some are free to download. And this shelf of paper Bibles has become redundant to many people because of online Bibles. So computer Bibles have really strong advantages. They enable you to compare several different English versions. Or I would think if you were working in German, maybe there's more than one German version, for example. You can compare several versions. You can do fast searches for words or phrases. And I've got a slide about that later. You can find where words in the foreign language are used. For example, in the New Testament, there are four Greek words that are most often translated love in English, but they have relatively quite different meanings in Greek. So you could investigate the meaning of the word love in English in the Bible and track down what was intended in the Greek language. Online Bibles link with other Bible study tools such as maps, commentaries and concordances. So here's the one that I use that is free. So this is what the screen looks like. So on the left is a book, a list of all the books of the Bible. The second column is the chapters available in each book. Then under the blue horizontal ribbon, you'll see ASV, CEV, CUV, CUV, ESV, Geneva, GNB, those are all the different versions of the Bible that I have downloaded. And on the right hand end, you have parallel and compare. So I can click on any verse and compare it 
how it's translated in each of those versions that I have downloaded. Below that, there are various software tools, and then there is the text of Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 14. Down below that, on the next horizontal ribbon, there is dictionaries that I have downloaded. And on the right hand side, there are commentaries and you can see I have got one, two, three, four, five that I can click on any of and get their commentary on the particular section of scripture that I have opened. So you can see that an online Bible does a large amount of things that you have to have lots of books on your shelf to do on paper. So they really do enhance the possibility of Bible knowledge very easily. Here's another one called BibleGateway.com. And where I've put this, the marker here, you will see this site offers many Bibles in foreign languages. So there's Amharic, Amitsko Guerrero, pardon my language, Arabic, Awaji, and Bulgarian. And so you can see it's going to go through the alphabet with many, many versions free from Bible Gateway. And for English ones, there is many audio. So you can look up a particular chapter and possibly, at least New Testament, have the reader read it to you. So that's a really wonderful site for all sorts of things about the Bible. There's maps available with particular references to like this one here, up at the top, the top white line, Mission to Greece. So that's a particular map from the New Testament about the preachers taking the gospel story into Asia Minor now called Turkey, Greece, Crete, Cyprus. So you can see that that's available. Logos.com downloaded free. So going back to eSword, if you look here, there's a pair of binoculars, small pair of Bible binoculars, Bible search, New International Version, and in the field below there, I've typed in the word baptized and move along to the right. And I'm searching for all of the words in Gospels and Acts. And then it gives me with baptized highlighted in every passage. So you can do a search of every time any word is used. You have whole Bible. Old Testament only, New Testament, a variety of search capabilities there. So that gives you a concordance. Also on eSword, you can download Bibles, commentaries, dictionaries, devotions, graphics, reference books, and updates. All free. So there's a lot of potential. Now, see on that screen, beside the text in the big field there, there are purple letters and numbers. So on the word, in verse 37, sorry, in verse 7, Exodus 34, verse 7, beside the first word, keeping, there's H5341. That means Hebrew word number 5341. 
and from somewhere oh my cursor in the blue gray the middle word is transgression and it says h6588 and down here in the dictionaries department is hebrew 6588 there's the word in hebrew there's the word how you say it in english and it means a revolt national moral or religious revolt translated rebellion sin transgression trespasses and it occurs 93 times in the king james version so that's what's going on on that screen as well as having the downloads open if you go fishing for online bible encyclopedias here's one example and it says the international standard bible encyclopedia also known as the isbe is an exhaustive biblical encyclopedia that explains in detail every significant word in the Bible and also includes historical information from the Apocrypha. It provides detailed information on the language and literature of the Bible world, their cultures and the historical and religious environments of the people of the Bible in articles by nearly 200 scholars. And down on the left is a great list of all the things that they have available on that Bible History Online website. That's just one of many. There are many useful websites for Bible study, daily Bible readings, question and answers, this one is called thisisyourbible.com where you can see it has questions and answers on many topics it has videos it has a contact information so there's many things on this particular bible website again there's many out there Here's the Bible Society of New Zealand, which contains very interesting information about the Bible in New Zealand society, the Bible in New Zealand, its history, the first Bibles printed in New Zealand, etc. So very interesting source, that one. So let's now go for the people who don't have access to online bibles let's just have a little consideration of paper bibles the format bibles with cross references are useful for finding related verses related chapters and related topics some bibles also have charts pictures and maps in the text which can be helpful so in that picture you can see that's a very modern printing of the bible which has this really good illustration of ancient jerusalem which is very helpful in the context of where it's been placed in that particular publishing of the bible some have a basic concordance like that one there in that picture others have explanatory footnotes so in a way you might say that paper bibles are limited in comparison to online and that's possibly true but these kind of bibles there's not much you need to look for outside what has been provided within the covers of these very modern published Bibles. 
text layout means how the text is arranged on a page where on a computer screen it tends to just go down the screen in um, paper bibles often a bible with good text layout prints the text in the natural paragraphs it includes subheadings which as you see in the picture helps it not to be just a big long line of letters and numbers. The headings and the paragraphs are not in the foreign language original 2000 year old writings, but they are people's attempts to make it easier to read and understand. And they're pretty good, most of them. Modern text layout Bibles put the poetic parts of the Bible in the natural stanzas rather than just listing them down the page. And they give lists of names or places in columns, which is very, very easier, much easier to understand than the oldest English Bibles. So cross references. This is a page out of my Bible, and you can see it contains the text. And on the left hand side of the page, there is a whole list of tiny letters and numbers. Those are called cross references. They're added by Bible publishers, added by people. They are a mix of quotations from other parts of the Bible. Similar or source ideas to the New Testament that are found in the Old Testament. A parallel record of the same or a similar event. More detail about a person, a place or a subject. Very, very helpful cross references are. Sometimes you might remember where one verse is, but you know that's not actually the verse you want, but if you go to it from its cross references, you might find the verse that you want to save you going and getting the concordance off the shelf. Or sometimes in the basic concordance in the back of the Bible, you will find a verse that gives you a, a link to the actual verse that you know that you want. So cross reps can be very useful for understanding and insight and all sorts of things. Footnotes. Footnotes are added by Bible publishers. There certainly were none in the original documents. They are intended to add to people's understanding. They provide the source of quotations from other books in the Bible. Now, in the book of Matthew that this page is taken from, there are many, many quotations from the Old Testament. And in the footnotes or the margin reference at the cross references, you find where those come from in the Old Testament. Very helpful information. You can check them out. Mostly they're word for word from the Old Testament. You find alternate suggestions for translation. Or sometimes it will say some documents include, and there's some more words. You'll find the meaning of non English words. So you may not be able to see this, but in amongst those notes, there's for chapter one, verse 17, which says, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. And then it's got a small number four, and if you go to the footnote, Christ or Messiah, the Christ Greek and the Messiah Hebrew both mean the anointed one. So that's a very typical example 
of what a footnote provides. They will often include Hebrew or Greek words. So if you slide down two more, oh, the next line down, 1 verse 21, Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua, which means the Lord saves this Bible publisher provided. And then the next note down in those footnotes see, tells you that chapter 1, verse 23, the quote is from Isaiah, a, an Old Testament book, chapter 7, verse 14. So many, many different things come in footnotes. So when you choose a paper Bible, Whatever's the layout and the appearance and the extras included in it, the message of the text is the same, other than translation differences. So you might choose some word meaning the same thing to what I might choose, but the meaning is the same the message of the text is the same. So in modern times, you have this plethora of choice as to what you would like to help you to understand. So when we come to study and search, paper sources, websites, apps, Wikipedia, there are so many places to search. Differences of opinion on some things have to be noted and decided on. They will come your way. There are alleged contradictions and alleged inconsistencies to sort out. Plus the challenge of literal or non-literal language. So some do's and don'ts. Do look first to the Bible itself for answers to your questions. Include all of the Bible when searching for answers to your questions. Try to find two or more verses that say the same and then compare them. Because one, they will be slightly different and they will give you more insight into the same ideas so that you can compare them for extra depth of understanding or for, I'm not quite sure about that there, what does that mean? Or a little bit of extra light might be shown or a different word used or a shorter sentence with less puzzles in the sentence. Don't expect quick answers. If you are absolutely a beginner, don't expect quick answers. Even if you are a, an experienced Bible student, there isn't always a quick answer. Remember, it grows as a person grows spiritually. Don't look at isolated passages and draw conclusions. Don't ever base anything on one verse. Always compare so that you get a much more rounded understanding. Don't leave the Bible on the shelf covered in dust. And write down questions. It might be a while before you get the answer. Just like studying any subject, no one knows all of the answers when they set out or they wouldn't bother studying. So write down the questions. So we're going to do some practical examples, some practical work in the Bible. We're going to look at literal or non-literal language, some, a couple of alleged contradictions, and a couple of alleged inconsistencies. 
how would you decide if a part of the Bible is literal or non-literal? Same concept as actual or virtual. Is it real or is it talking about something else? So the Bible contains some symbolic language. Don't start your Bible journey with reading Revelation. It's full of symbols, not reality. Plenty of reality in there as well, but the symbols can be very, very challenging. So don't start there. Most of the Bible can be understood literally. So I loved this picture that I found on Google Images. This is the story. This is a picture of this parable that the Lord Jesus told. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep? until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. When he, then he calls together his friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And here's the meaning. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So the shepherd going to fetch the sheep is literal, but the meaning is the effort God goes to to reclaim lost sinners. A general rule for literal or non-literal is that it should be understood literally unless there is a good reason not to. For example, if it doesn't make sense literally, then it's not meant to be literal. Sometimes there's a direct statement that it is not literal. And there's sometimes very strong evidence that a symbol is being used. Now, this picture is of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21. It is pictured as a golden cube with 12 gates, all pearls, and the measure, the dimensions are 2,200 kilometers on each of the faces. In the story, it comes down from heaven. It clearly cannot be literal. It must be symbolic. So many of the stories in the, in the Bible are clearly just literal accounts of literal things, but there is non-literal that you have to sort out. So let's do some examples here. For example, Matthew described a story that Jesus told as a parable. And this is the story. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. So in verse 3 of Matthew 13, it says, Jesus told them many things in parables. 
and a parable, the meaning, is a short story to illustrate or teach some truth, principle, or lesson. And in verses 18 to 23 of that chapter, Jesus himself gives the explanation. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So the birds, the seed landed on the path and the birds came and took it. So Jesus says that someone who hears, but it doesn't mean anything. So it's taken away from him. This is the seed along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he doesn't have any root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. So that's the plant that was withered by the sun because it grew in a rock, on a rock and didn't have any earth to put roots into. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Now you see how for each of the pieces of ground that the seed fell on, Jesus gave the analogy to different kinds of people or different situations in our life. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So that's about taking in the message from of God and being able to share that with other people, which is what Jesus wants people to be able to do. So there's an example of a parable with a non-literal meaning, but obviously the story is a factual story. So here's another one that Jesus told where he said, it's like, in Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the storms rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. When the rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, it fell with a great crash. So you can clearly see there that the stories are literal stories, but they have a non-literal meaning, another meaning that Jesus wants people to absorb from the story. Sometimes the use of symbols is clear. So in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 11, it says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. So he is the shoot that comes up from the tree stump of Jesse. This clearly is a person, not a tree. And the descendant in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, 
is Jesus Christ. In your own time, look up Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 6, where it tells you that in Jesus' family tree, one of his ancestors was Jesse, the father of David. So the shoot out of the cut down tree is a person, not a tree. The spirit of the Lord of knowledge and of understanding does not rest on a tree. It is talking about a person. So those are some clues about how to sort out symbols and literal passages in the Bible. So let's look at some consistency ideas. Many people claim the Bible contains contradictions. Many of those people are openly enemies of the Bible or have little or no knowledge of it. If the Bible did contain contradictions, it could be dismissed as not God's words. If it agreed in every tiny detail, it would appear contrived and it would disallow the individual writer's personalities. Often, with a little more study, the alleged contradictions are shown to be in harmony. And look at some of these challenges. But first, I'm going to give you a story. Some of you will know this story the blind men and the elephant. The parable of the blind men and an elephant originated in the ancient Indian subcontinent. It is a story of a group of blind men who have never come across an ele elephant before and who learn and conceptualize what the elephant is by touching it. Each blind man feels a different part of the elephant's body, but only one part, such as the side or the tusk or the tail. They then describe the elephant based on their limited experience and their descriptions of the elephant are different from each other. In some versions of the story, they come to suspect that the other person is dishonest and they come to blows. So one visualizes a trunk, one visualizes a rope, one visualizes the, the part of a tree or a piece of furniture. So because they can't see, they can only feel and they're limited to one section of the elephant. Each has a different description. The moral of the parable is that humans have a tendency to claim absolute truth based on their limited subjective experience as they ignore other people's limited subjective experiences, which may be equally true. So what the blind men told in the story was absolutely true, but it was a limited perspective so that you got an elephant that looks like that. You got the body of the elephant depicted as a wall, the ears depicted as a fan, the tusks as a spear, the, the nose as a snake, and the tail as a rope, the trunk as a snake, sorry, a word wouldn't come, and the legs as pieces of a tree. But for each of those people with their limited viewpoint, or the perspective that they had, that's what the elephant would look like. 
until you put all the story together. So sometimes with your Bible study, that is exactly what you have to do. So with that in mind, here is a very easy and small example. The sign on Jesus' cross. In each of the gospel stories, the words are slightly different. So Matthew in chapter 27 says, the notice on the cross said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark wrote, the King of the Jews. Luke wrote, this is the King of the Jews. John wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. If four people standing on four different parts of an intersection described a vehicle accident, you would get four different accounts, all true and all part of the whole story. So the sign probably read, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So there's an example of how you can come up with a feasible, believable explanation of four different statements by four different writers. What about is something consistent? Are Bible passages consistent? So this is quite a fascinating, to me, fascinating example of consistency. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, it tells, it, it says this. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. And he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. So why are they coming to be healed in the evening? People usually come in the day to the doctor. So is there an explanation? And in Mark chapter 1, there's another, there's some more comments that Mark makes that say this. Mark 1, verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. And in verse 32 to 34, same day, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. So why are people coming in the evening and why are they coming on a Sabbath? Was it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Sabbath today, you will hear Jewish people refer to as Shabbat, and it originally it, no, it was Saturday on, on the original Western calendar. The Western calendar in recent years has shifted so that what was the seventh day is now the sixth day. But when the calendar was set up, Saturday was day seven, Sunday was day one of the next week. So in Jewish law, it wasn't legal to heal on the Sabbath day, and you'll find that in Matthew 12, verse 10. Going from that place, to, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And if we compare back in the Old Testament, in the law that God gave, to Israel, we find this. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the people would not come during the day on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, because it was not legal to be healed. So what's the significance of them coming in the evening? Was it just a coincidence? No, they came in the evening because Sabbath had finished by then. For them, the new day started at sunset, not the following midnight. So engage brain for an understanding of this. The story has the ring of truth. Have a look at the calendar of this slide. Okay, so you've got black and white squares there. The black, if you look at the key in the picture, is sunset to sunrise, approximately 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And the white is sunrise to sunset, approximately 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Now, see the line that says Roman calendar? Look how on our day it starts in the middle of the night. So when Jacinda closed Auckland down to level three a couple of weeks ago, it started at 11.59 p.m. on a certain day on the Wednesday evening, because that's when the new day begins. In a Jewish brain, new day does not start at midnight. It's already started at sunset the previous day. Therefore, if you go along the top line, Jewish day seven, Sabbath, it finishes at sunset. So the people came to be healed once Sabbath had ended and it was the first day of the week. It's like getting up at 12.30 in the morning and saying, right, it's already Friday when the sun hasn't come up and the light hasn't come. So it's a bit of a misconception of how we use the words, but just the Jewish people of Israel set the new day by, I think it's when the evening star appears after the sun's gone. So when it's writing in the gospels about people coming to be healed, they're coming as soon as the sun's gone down because Shabbat is finished. They don't have to wait till the next day. So you see an interesting consistency in the New Testament with the law that was given in the Old Testament. So there's a quite famous story in the Old Testament of David and Goliath. And people understand today that this is a hormone disorder that created this very tall gentleman in this picture here with the ordinary sized women beside him. So in the Old Testament, they're called giants. And I think this condition today might be called giantism. It's obviously got some medical description these days. But here's three interesting Old Testament references that were written between four and 500 years apart. So when the people of Israel sent some spies out to look at the land that God had promised them, the spies came back with 
two stories that were quite different. A lot of them said, oh, it's a real scary place with walled cities and giants. And two spies said, two of the 12 said, yeah, no problem. God can overcome any of that for us. So here's the verse in Numbers chapter 13. The men who had gone up said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. So the point to note is that there were people in this country with this giantism factor in their bodies. If we turn over to later in Joshua chapter 11, we find this in verses 21 and 22. At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Amakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Deba, and Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. So the people with giantism, the descendants of Anak, were only in what is today the Gaza Strip. They were in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. And when we turn over to the famous story in 1 Samuel 17, the people of the Gaza Strip in those days called Philistines had attacked Israel and they had a giant that they brought out to intimidate the Israeli army. And it says in chapter 17, verse 4, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. So we have these three records put together are all consistent to small detail and they certainly add credibility that people who wrote at quite different times all inadvertently provide the same story that can be reconciled. That is very, very typical Bible consistency. Go search for yourself. Here's a study exercise to work on. We're not going to do it now, but when you have time. Find and read the first chapter of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 to 17. It's a list of names. It's the family tree of Joseph, the foster father of Jesus Christ. There are five women named in that family tree. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba and Mary. The first four of those women are Old Testament characters. Read their stories here. Tamar, the abandoned widow, she is in Genesis chapter 38, the first book of the Bible, Genesis 38. Rahab, the non-Jewish prostitute from the reading that we did Joshua chapter 2. She looked after the spies from Israel who entered Jericho. 
the first city the people of Israel encountered in Israel was Jericho. And she was a prostitute who lived on the city wall. And her story, we read the first part of it in Joshua chapter two, read the rest in chapter six. There's Ruth, the non-Jewish widow from Moab. The entire book of Ruth, fascinating story, that one. Bathsheba, the unfaithful wife, again, Old Testament, second book of Samuel, chapters 11 and 12. Mary, pregnant, unmarried, is the New Testament character in Matthew 1 and Luke 1. Most of the stories told in Luke 1. So find and read the record about Rahab, the second woman in the family line. And here's some questions to consider. What is her story? Where did she live? At what time in history did she live? All of these are things you can research. Was she from Israel? Where were her family from? No, she wasn't from Israel. And her story, she was a prostitute. Looked down on, no doubt. At what time in history? You can research, you'll find it's about 1,400 years. 300 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Would you have put Rahab in Jesus' ancestors list? Is a good question to consider. Why would you have put her in? Why might you not have included her? For me personally, I think I'd like Jesus Christ to have an unblemished family line. But if you research those women, you find, no, he didn't. He had a very ordinary family line. So that's a takeaway for you to flesh out and think about and do in your own time. In fact, you can do that with all of those women. Read the stories, figure out why you think they might have been put in the line by God or why you might not have put them in. What is the common factor about each of those women that would lead to God choosing them to have them in the family line of Jesus Christ? So, summary. Many resources exist to throw light on God's message. Loved that picture. Language, customs, culture, spiritual concepts and alleged problems can all be answered through the use of the resources and seeking guidance. Enjoy getting to know about God and his message to people. next time. Thank you for joining today's seminar. Topic for seminar 15, God willing, reasons to believe the Bible, the four metal statue. Seminars are online Thursdays 12.30 New Zealand time. There's the web ID for joining. Earlier seminars can be found at this web reference. And for contact details, see that website. Thank you.